the um i don't know what which one it is but it's the one where you're like coming up with all the inputs you know number of children cost of meal and you're getting it uh to have a subtotal but i was getting like really ridiculously long decimals for the calculation yeah um so i was wondering how to just have it round because it's it's like it's trying to get to that uh -huh. but it's you know seven zeros and like an eight yeah um, so, so to get that format correctly does anyone know the answer to that and how do you round stuff in python i think i might know the answer yeah matt do you want to share your screen actually uh sure yeah uh it's disabled currently my bad sorry about that i'm good okay you should be able to share now all right awesome um so at least the way I understand it, it's this function right here. You put the, the colon space dot two F. So that's going to round it to two decimal places after the, the decimal, the two, two units after the decimal. Is that correct? Yeah, that's perfect. So this is the easiest way to round, at least that I'm aware of. There are a couple of other methods to round. Uh, but the nice thing about this is usually when you're rounding, you don't want to round while you're doing calculations because um, depending on what you're rounding, I could end up with invalid data. For example, uh, let's say somebody is, um, I have like uh, an e-commerce type application and someone like adds something to their cart and I calculate tax right away. Um, and then later on, I go ahead and like take off their discount and and then at some point I round in there, but then they add something else to their cart and I have to reround or re-add tax. So when you're rounding stuff, you never wanna do it while you're calculating. Generally, the only time you're ever going to wanna round anything is when you're displaying something to the user. Okay, at like the very end after all your calculations are done. And this is really nice because um, right here on line three, Matt has this, the format that we talked about the other day and he can insert the variable right there. And it's just 0.2F, we'll just round it to two decimal places. And you can make that 50 decimal places or one. Uh, it defaults to zero if you just don't put it there. Um, but yeah, it's awesome. And does that help? Awesome. Matt, thanks for sharing the screen. That was great. Yep, you're welcome. Okay, other questions, you guys? I have a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. So for the uh, the import math function, yeah. uh, where you can do like the the ceiling floor exponent and like sign and stuff like that, um, I wasn't sure exactly how to implement that. Like I was, I was trying to do it um, in the uh, in the program. I just wasn't able to figure it out. If somebody might be able to help me out with that. Yeah. Does anyone have have an answer, or, or has anyone used? The math functions before. Elijah, do you, do you want to go ahead and share? Yeah, so I've used it with um, other languages, and I would assume it's the same with Python. Um, but the math would be the class, so it's got tons of other um, methods in it. And so the math you call, like for the example, we use pi. So you're just using import math, so you're importing it from. Um, the set of libraries given to you by Python, and it, it has all these other functions that you can use um, that are predefined that just accept arguments um, and will assist in creating these outputs, right? Yes, yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, let's go ahead and look at an example of that. So I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, so, this is not Python. Let me close that real quick. Uh, and I'm just going to make a temporary file in here. It's called temp.py. Okay, let's say I wanted to use something with math. All right. Uh, it's as simple as Elijah just said. So I just have to say import math. Now, where is this coming from? It seems like magic. It's not. Where is this math stuff coming from? A library inside of Python itself. Yeah, you, so we installed Python, right? And when you installed Python, 
Um, yes, it made it so that you could run Python commands on your computer, but there's also a bunch of Python modules like math that are there. Now, the reason why Python doesn't always run with all of these by default is a performance issue, all right? Imagine that I have a program that uses 100 lines of code or a thousand, let's say 1,000 lines of code. Um, now, right here, if I just say, um, I'll just say like print, uh, this is fun. If I run this, you'll say, oh, that program's only a single line of code. And that's true. But the amount of code that runs to get this to print into the console is probably several thousand lines of code. And it's just built into Python, right? That's a print function. I didn't write that print function. I'm just utilizing it, okay? Um, and it's the exact same thing with all these other modules. So when I say import math or, or import date time, um, what that'll do is it'll, it'll take a chunk of code, a big old chunk of code, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of lines long, and it will say, okay, now all of this is accessible to this program. So when I say import math, as soon as I do that, it's gonna go and find that math module, no matter how long it is, and it'll say, okay, now we've just expanded our code base in this program for stuff that we can use, okay? And so now I could say, uh, all right, uh, math.seal, oh, look at that. Let's just look at that for a sec. Okay, all of a sudden, these are all functions in math. Uh, there are a few constants in here as well, like E. You can see it has a little bit of a different icon. Uh, but the rest of these that we've seen so far, these are all just different functions, okay? 95% uh, of which I've never touched in my entire life. And 95% of which you will probably never touch either unless you go into like some super mathematic heavy jobs, okay? Um, I, I'm a web developer by trade. And so I know a lot of different programming languages and platforms, but I've never had to do like super heavy math you know, in, in any of my applications. Uh, but anyways, so you can see there's all, there are all these different things available in here as soon as I imported math that weren't here previously, all right? So all these different modules in Python aren't available by default because Python wants to run quickly. If I all of a sudden imported 50 different modules, uh, it might take 10 times as long to run a simple print statement, even if the amount of code I'm writing is just as long as it was before. Um, but anyway, so we import it. That'll go ahead and say, all right, we have this whole module, all this code we now have access to. And then we can say, all right, um, I want to print and we'll say math.py. All right, just a really simple one. And let's go ahead and run this. So I'm gonna open this in my terminal and I'll say py, temp.py and Here's, here's math.py getting printed out for us. All right, so it's really simple. Uh, the different functions, there are a lot of them. As you just saw, I can look at them all right now just by saying math dot and VS Code will open them up for me. If I wanted to look at these, I could just say uh, Python math and click on W3 schools. Okay, if I wanted like a comprehensive list of every single thing, I know I keep saying this, I can go to the docs, okay, uh, but 95% of what you will ever see or use, um, you, can, you can find right here, okay? And it'll say, oh, uh, gamma returns the gamma function at X. And I can click on it and I can see uh, how it works. Okay, you can see the imported math and they're just printing it just like we just printed math.py. Um, looks like math.gamma is a function, all right? And it takes a single parameter which it just said was X. I have no idea what gamma is, all right? Um, but all of these you can look at, and a lot of these you will use. Maybe sign you'll use a bunch. Uh, square root, uh, I'm pretty sure everyone ends up using square root at some point. Uh, is not a number, that's an interesting one. Uh, is finite, math.floor, that's a really common one. A rounds number down to the nearest integer, okay? So this is another way, we looked at a way a little bit ago, Matt showed us his screen when he shared how to round to a certain number of decimal places. Math.floor will force any number to be an integer and it will always force it to round down. It basically just like chops off the decimal point and anything after it and you end up with that whole number. Uh, Math.seal does the opposite thing, math.sealing, okay? Uh, rounds a number up. No matter how small the decimal is, it'll force this number to round up. 
Um, so anyways, there's a bunch of these, all right? And I'll, all I did was Google just Python math and they're all right here and I could click on any one of them and practice and see how they're used. Uh, but all of them, they're, they're pretty simple and they all look really, really similar to one another. If I clicked on math.seal, you'll see we did the same thing. We import math and then we call the math.seal function and it takes a parameter. Otherwise, what are you gonna round? All right. Um, okay, any questions on this? Was that was that helpful? Okay, awesome. All right. Other questions? These are great questions, guys. Sweet. Well, let's go through some slides then. Uh, let me share my or present this here. All right. Uh, again, everything to do this lesson, pretty much the same as last lesson that, that was finished up uh, today. Uh, checkpoint team activity, your reading, your proof assignment, and then a reflection. All right, using format strings, F before the string. Uh, we saw an example of this outside of a print statement. Okay, Matt's line of code uh, assigned this to a variable. Okay, let's go ahead and look at at that one more time. So I'm gonna take math out of here for now and I'll just say name equals, and then I could say F, which is format, and I can put that before the quotation marks of any string. It doesn't matter if it's inside of a print statement or not. Um, let's say I had another variable before here, I said X is 20. Um, let's actually make that a string. And then inside of format, I can just say, um, some name and then a variable um, and it'll go ahead and format that for me and put that into the name variable. All right. Uh, outside of that, I can always just print. I feel like this is the most common way that you'll see it. Generally, people just use the format when they're printing something because that's generally generally when you want to format something. All right. And, and we looked at a couple examples of that uh, on Monday. Okay, so the thing with this is the F comes before the string, whether you're assigning it to a variable or just printing it or putting it in the parentheses of any function call. Um, and then the curly braces allow you to inject data or other variables, okay? And what that will do is basically just append, it'll just insert that as a string into the string. And then by the time it prints, it doesn't recognize the difference of variables. It'll just see one big string with everything combined in there. Uh, let's keep going. So the format function after the string. So the F before the string, we always say that that's format because you're kind of formatting a string. Uh, really, it just allows you to, to work with dynamic data. Uh, but there is a format function that you can put after a string. Now, the F is great. Um, and it's probably more widely used just because it's more simple. Uh, but the format function, uh, notice the word and then the opening parentheses. This is a for, this is a function called format. Uh, this function does allow a little bit more flexibility um, and it does exist. And if I wanted to see anything uh, that it can do, again, I could just come over here and say Python format function. And we can look at a few examples of what it does. Okay. But for most of the stuff that you guys are going to be doing, you could get away with either one of these. They're both great. You could even get away with not using either one of them. Does anybody know how, does anybody know how to put a variable into a string without using the F before the string or format? Is it using the plus sign? Yeah. Yeah. It's not a trick question. You nailed it. Okay. So if I have, uh, let's say, I have a variable called X and I say X is um, some value, okay? And then right here I can say, uh, I am going to print X, all right? And then I could even put a period right there. Now, if I wanted to say, let's go ahead and run this real quick just so we can see what it looks like. All right, got a nice string here. If I was going to print this exact same thing a different way, I could say print, Quotation marks, I am going to print okay, and let's run it, see what happens. All right, they are the exact same thing. Now the second one's not very pretty. 
All right. So some people might prefer it, uh, but I feel like once you learn how to use this F here, it, it just, it's a lot nicer. You know, I had to type in a lot less quotation marks and pluses and spaces, and it, it's just nicer to work with. Uh, let's try. Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, can you do that with multiple variables? If you had like uh, X and Y, could you just put a single F and then put the variables in that sentence? Yeah. So let's put it right after this. I'll just throw a Y in here. And then I'll throw a Y uh, into the same spot here. I'll comment that out for now. Oh, my bad. So it's not letting me print it because it is an integer. Okay, and it's like, hey, I can't um, concat, I can only concatenate strings, not ints. So right here, if I wanted to put this here, I could either say, um, we'll go ahead and, and turn this into a string right here, or I could put it, I could turn it into a string um, in each case down here, which if I was going to do it in every case, I might as well just leave it as a string in one place. Okay, then I wouldn't have to type in the string function multiple times. Okay, now we turn those into strings. Let's see if it works. All right, and so you can see I did successfully print multiple variables in both of these. Okay, and you can see how both of these worked. Um, and, and it would work the exact same way if I put it as a string up in here and took both of these off and hit save. It'll run exactly the same. Okay, great question. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the format one. So I'm going to come back over here and look at format and you can see um, text.format price equals 49. Hmm, interesting. So price is something that is built into, um, we have it right here. We, we just declared price as 49. And then we said that we were going to go ahead and print text, which is this string right here. But then we said format and we're going to throw price into it. All right. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can work with format. Uh, me personally, I don't really like doing this very often just because it seems a little bit jumbled. Um, but it is possible and there are other use cases for it as well. Uh, so let's look down here. Let's look at this example. Okay, so my name is F name and I'm age. Okay, and then we assigned F name equals John and age equals 36. All right, and then this one, uh, they didn't put the variable names. They just said, hey, uh, I'm going to have a comma delimited list inside of my format function. And in the first spot, I'm going to put John at zero and then 36 at one. Okay, now this could be really nice if the user was going to enter a bunch of data and I didn't know how much or I didn't know what they were going to enter. This could be really nice for displaying that data back to them. But there's a lot of different ways that you can use it. Okay. All right. Questions on printing with the F, printing with the format, and printing with string concatenation. Any questions? Sweet. All right, let's come back over here. Okay, displaying decimal numbers. So we kind of looked at this. So cars equals three, people equals eight. Uh, people, per, people per car equals people divided by cars. If I wanted to round this to one decimal, uh, and we saw this earlier, okay, I have an F here. And I could say people per car colon dot one F, which will round it to one decimal. All right. And the output would be there are 2.7 people in each car. Round to two decimals, we do the exact same thing just with the two, like we saw on Matt's screen. Okay. Um, Brother Birch, I have a question. Yeah, please. So um, in the print statement, the people per car. Is it a number or a string there? Ooh, that's a great question. So let's test this out and let's see if this will work. So I'm gonna copy this whole thing because it, it doesn't look like a string to me. 
So let's. I'm going to paste it right here. Um, okay, and let's see what happens. I'm going to comment out that other stuff, and I saved it. Up arrow and enter. Okay, look at that. So why did this work? We just tried, just like half a second ago, we tried to print y as an integer inside of a string and it didn't work. So what is different about these three examples? Any guesses? Is it the like the dot 1f, dot 2f? Yep, that's exactly what it is. Because if you think about, this doesn't look like a typical function, right? Generally, when we think about a function, we think about like a word with a parenthesis right after it. But a function will always return something. If you think about uh, like this function, for example, it will always return a string. Even if the user types in like the number five, it will return five inside of quotation marks and it'll be a string. Well, this guy right here, what it'll do is it will convert our number into the number with the right number of decimal places. And then because it knows that it's being used to format inside of a string, it will convert it to a string, okay? And so that deals with that issue for us and we don't have to worry about it. Why do you have to put the point 0.1 and point 0.2 and point 0.3? That determines how many decimal places you want to round to. Gotcha. Yeah, we could put anything that we wanted to. If I had a really, really big number and I wanted to see like 10 digits of precision in that decimal, I could. I would just put a 10 there, so. Great question. Okay. So well, let's keep going. All right, using the math library. So we already looked at this a little bit to get any of these functions to work. What do you have to do first? Import math. Import math. Yep. So let's try, let me just show you guys a very common error amongst beginners. If I just say uh, print math.py. Ooh, notice something here. I typed in math and I said dot. Look at what VS Code did. It didn't give me my, my huge library of like 50 different functions. Okay, it's because it's not accessible in this Python file yet, but let's try this anyways. I say print math.py. I'm gonna come down in here, I hit save up arrow, hit enter, and math is not defined, okay? So I'm gonna come up in here, and I'm gonna fix that by saying import math, all right? Uh, once I hit save, notice this red, this red line is still here. That's because VS Code doesn't always update on every keystroke, uh, but it will always update every time you save a file. So I'm gonna hit save, and the red line's gone. Okay, it checked for errors, it, it rechecked for errors as soon as I hit save, and it's like, oh, yep, math is declared, we don't have that error anymore. Uh, if I started typing math down here, um, I didn't show my whole thing. Uh, it might be because I'm just putting it out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, there we go. Okay, it does show the whole library here, and I'll just say math.py, I can save it, up arrow, hit enter, and, and it works. Okay, so these are a couple of the really common ones. Uh, we already talked about math.seal, which will round a, or will force a number to round up. Uh, we talked about math.floor, which will force a number to round down. Any idea on how these might be used in the real world? Like what, what would be a good use case for using math.floor? Why would we wanna force something to round down? When you, the whole people per car thing. Yeah. You can't have 2.6 people in a car. So seriously. Two or three. Yeah, great. How about math.seal? When would we want to force the number to round up? Estimating the amount of something that you need for a project. Yeah. Yeah. You can't go lower. You, you'd have to have a little extra. Awesome. Uh, math.exp raises e to the power of value. Okay. And so um, this is just a really, a really easy way to, to use exponents. Uh, Math.sign computes the trigonometry sine function of value in radians. And like we saw a second ago, there's a bunch of these. Okay, but any questions on these? Okay. 
Um, so here's an example of using math.py. And here's an example of using math.floor and math.seal. Uh, notice math.py is a constant. And I can tell that just because it's not a function here. All right. Whereas math.floor and math.seal, they both have parentheses after them. They're calling a function that will do something with a value that you give it. So in this case, we're passing 1.65 into math.floor. It'll force the number to round down. And then we're passing 1.65 into math.seal and I'll force the number to round up. Okay, but in both cases, if I tried to call math.floor without anything in it, I get an error. Floor takes exactly one argument. And if I had no idea what that meant, I could Google it and look at W3 schools and see some examples of math.floor and be like, okay, I don't really know what this does. Um, but just so you know, that's the type of error that you will get if you try to call a function without an argument that requires one. All right. Okay. Uh, styling, good style. Look how pretty this is. This is fantastic. All right. What are, what are a couple of things you guys notice just looking at these three lines of code? What looks good? The spacing between everything like area, space, equals, space, length, space, times, space, width. It does look nice, doesn't it? Okay, anything else? Anyone else notice something different? All of the variables are lowercase and have uh, underscore where spaces would normally be. Yeah, seriously, that's awesome. Great, anything else? Also, those variables have like proper names, like um, they're not just like so simple that you can't understand it later when you go back to it. Yep, yep, it's very clear what they're referring to. Great. Um, so let's look at bad style. All right. Now, bad style obviously goes into variable con variable name conventions, like Cody and Matt mentioned. Uh, but notice how different these look just by changing about changing around the spaces. All right. Uh, this last one right here uh, goes right into the variable naming. Okay. Uh, I would even prefer camel case over just all lowercase. If you're going to have multiple words. It's just hard to read multiple words unless you separate them out a bit, uh, whether with camel case or underscores. But the four above it, uh, the only thing that's changed for all these is just where the spaces are and how many spaces there are. Uh, will these run? Will Python run these? Yes. Yes, it will. Python really doesn't care about your spacings outside of indentation inside of functions and if statements and things like that. But as far as where you put spaces, it doesn't care, but you should care and you, sh and you should be consistent. I have seen a lot of people who prefer to do something like this. Anytime they do math, um, they don't wanna take up all the space, excuse the pun. Um, and so they just won't have any spaces. They'll say um, total family age equals, i will say 36 plus 28 plus six plus four plus two plus one. Okay, whoops. All right, some people do this because one, maybe they're just lazy and they don't wanna put the spaces in, but when they get into a lot of math, they don't like having the extra space there. Um, what I suggest that all of you guys do is to have spaces because it makes it nice and clear. It makes it nice and easy to read. Yes, it takes up a little bit more space, but that's okay, okay? What else is gonna happen on this line anyways? And even if it, go, even if it goes further than I would like, then that's, that's still okay. All right, um, but I would recommend that you have those spaces uh, around the equal signs too, all right? My program would work just fine if I left it like that, but I think that is just horribly ugly, okay? Um, but it's your call, okay? You guys are the programmers. If you're like, you know what? I don't like space anymore. Uh, you, guys, you guys do what you want. Um, with that said, know that there are some jobs that will require you to follow a certain coding convention. All right, uh, Python doesn't enforce that you use underscores in your variable names that have multiple words. Uh, but some jobs will force you to uh, adhere to different standards that they have, okay. All right, oh, question, let's see. I have, I have a question not related to the, the adding or the spaces, but like yeah. the commenting. I saw you earlier, you like selected a whole chunk of code and commented it out. Yeah. 
And I just want to know what you did for that one. Because Hey, you guys, th this stuff right here can change your life. I remember I took this database class when I was here at BYU-Idaho. And it was awesome. Like I learned a lot of great stuff about, about databases. But the other thing I learned in that class was about Sublime. Sublime is a text editor, uh, very similar to VS Code. Uh, I'll go into that another time why I switched over. Uh, but I used Sublime for years and it was because of this class. And the things that I learned in that class with Sublime, I have used pretty much every day of my life since. And the database stuff has benefited me also, um, <laughs> but definitely not as much. So um, commenting out multiple lines, if I just make a selection uh, and I hit control forward slash, it'll comment them out. Okay, if I have just a single line and I don't have anything selected and I hit control forward slash, it comments it out. Okay, I use that all the time. All right, uh, another one that was asked, how do you do that? Let's see, adding spaces between the plus signs. Okay, control Z, control Z, right there. Uh, the trick here is making multiple cursors. And there's a couple of different ways to do that. One, let me just make a couple of lines here. Uh, if I hold control on my keyboard and click somewhere else, I now have two cursors and I can type in both places at the same time. Uh, now, depending on your computer, uh, you might have to hold alt control or, or sorry, not alt control, alt click or command click. <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> All right. Um, but you can look in preferences. I don't think it's in the keyboard shortcuts, actually. It's not, it's gotta be in the settings. We'll go into the keyboard shortcuts in a sec. This is a really a really good tangent to get on you guys. I'm really excited. Um, let's see, I just type in cursor here. Hmm. Ooh, multi-cursor modifier. Okay, that's what it's called. Um, the modifier to be used to add multiple cursors with the mouse, all right? Uh, the default was Alt for my computer and I wanted it to be Control. So that's where it is. You can just go to settings, multi-cursor modifier. Um, and that just basically allows you to just click anywhere and make some cursors and you can start typing, okay? Now let's go into some other ones here. Um, if I have something selected, like a string. I could have any string selected. This is just like doing like control F in Google where you search for something, all right? Uh, if I hit control D, then it will select the next instance of that string. So earlier, when I added all those spaces around the pluses, all I did was I selected one of the pluses, I held control D to select all of them. And then I said, right arrow, space, left arrow, left arrow, space. Okay, because it put a cursor on each one of those, which is awesome. Yeah, Cody, seriously, I thought I had the same thought when I was in that class. I'm like, man, this is amazing. Uh, there are a few other ones that I really like. So um, with that string, I, I could do that with anything. If I wanted to change a variable name, uh, let's say I had um, control C, control V. Let's say I had a variable that I used a bunch. Um, I could hit control D on that and change it to anything and just change that variable name just like that, which would be really easy. Um, if and that'll had, work no matter where any of those are at, it'll change yes. all of them. Yeah. Um, so like, let's say that was up here. It doesn't matter where it is. It'll just find every instance of that string in my document and it'll, and it'll select it while I, while I'm pressing control D. Okay. If it turns out that I had a birthday and I'm not 28 anymore, really easy to change. Um, another big one is right here. If I want to add a cursor to the end of every line, this is huge. I use this all the time. Um, it's control shift L. And then I have a cursor at the end of every line. And then I can just start typing whatever I want to type. So for example, this right here, all right, this is just a list of videos that I'm planning to make for a class. Uh, this was made, these 26 lines were made in all of like two seconds. All right, I went to Google Sheets and I typed in one, two, three, and then I selected them and dragged so that it made a numbered list up to 13. And then with all those numbers there, um, 
Let me just delete some of these real quick. Okay, here's another one. Control Alt down arrow will just allow me to go down the line. And then I can hit Shift Home, delete, Control, Shift N, delete, and there's my numbered list. Okay, and then from here, I was just like week, and then whatever number it is, then I could hit end. I can use home, end, control, left arrow to kind of like move around, regardless of how big a word is. Um, and I just said like prove intro. And then, so, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff that you guys can do. Um, these keyboard shortcuts, these ones right here, are pretty much the ones I use like on a daily basis. The add cursor above and below, that's what I just showed you. And these might not be the key binding that you guys have in your VS Code. Okay, I've probably changed this at some point because I have another program on my computer that I use for lots of different hotkeys. Uh, add cursor to line ends, control shift L, add line comment. That was the first one that we talked about. Um, but I said control forward slash, that's what I've always used. Uh, and then add selection to find next match, control D. So uh, Alt A, that's a really cool one to align cursors. Uh, let's look at that real quick. So if I have all these equal signs and I want them all to line up, I can hit Alt A and it lines them up really nicely, which is, is one of the things that I learned with SQL taken CIT 225. Um, I wanted the equal signs to line up. So uh, anyways, that was a good tangent. Thanks guys. Uh, any, any questions? Just play around with it. Uh, going into those keyboard shortcuts, this is recorded. And like I said, these are pretty much like all I ever use, at least on a daily basis. So, all right, let, let's go back to Python. All right. Um, before we go into this activity, I want to do, um, Connor, I'm glad. <laughs> uh, I want to do a Kahoot with you guys. Okay, so if we have time after our Kahoot, then we'll go ahead and go into breakout rooms. Uh, and I'll let you guys work on that. Okay. All right, no teams, we'll just do one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, so go to kahoot.it or open the Kahoot app and there's your pin. Man, quick draws, you guys. Connor, that was impressive. While you guys are signing up, can I just ask how how is the class feeling for you guys? I know that we're on the block and we're going like super fast, but how are you guys feeling? That's awesome. Sweet, you guys. You guys are smart. I don't think I ever took a block class when I was a student. It is crazy fast, but it's very organized. So, so far I'm really liking that. I really like the way that all assignments are very well explained. I'm glad, I'm glad. Okay, well, let's go ahead and start this. Uh, we have 19 in Zoom, so if anyone hasn't joined yet, you can still join after we start. I'll blow that up. All right, guys, stakes are high. What is the output of the following code? Sweet. Does anyone want to explain how it's hello dash world? Well, 
Well, it's basically just saying to print hello and also print world. And as a separation, print the dash. Yeah, so who knew print could do that? All right, pretty much all we've looked at print for is just like printing a string. We threw an F before some of the strings, right? Um, but yeah, print, I mean, right here, we're seeing three different arguments or parameters in print. So great, you guys. Okay, let's go to our next one. Quick question. So if you're to do that, but have like multiple words, like three or four words, would it still put a dash in between each of them? Yes. Yep. Okay. Nice work. So why was it six? Two times three. Yeah, it sounds really simple, but it is really simple. Okay, a couple of people missed it, but that's because it, it can be kind of tricky. When you have a print statement, I could print the letter Z. All right, if I wanted to print the letter Z, here's what it would look like. I'd have to put it into quotation marks or have a variable uh, like name, which has the value of that, and then I could print that variable. In this case, we have x equals two, y equals three, and then z gets the value of two times three, which is six. And then we'll go ahead and print that value, which was six. Why didn't those need to be specified as integers or float for it to do the math? Yeah, so by default, um, if I declare numbers and they're not in quotation marks, then I can do math with them. Python will recognize those as numbers so if I come over here, um, immediately as I as soon as I assign this, uh, it'll recognize that name is a string. And then let's say I had a couple more variables here. Let's say I had x equals five and y equals 5.5. And I'm gonna copy this line of code here, x and y. And let's see what we get for all of these. Python's not very smart, but it is smart enough to know what kind of data it's getting outside of our inputs, just because input is a function that always returns a string, no matter what you put in. But if I'm just writing code and I'm declaring a variable with a number, then it'll go ahead and recognize, oh, five is a number and it doesn't have a decimal. So I'm going to make it an integer. And 5.5 is a number and I need a decimal spot for it. So I'm going to save it as a float. Okay. And so it'll do that automatically. So when we had, you know, x equals two, y equals three, and z equals uh, x times y, uh, it just recognized these as numbers and it could go ahead and do that math just right away. That explains it, thank you. Yeah, great question. So you can print numbers um, in a print statement? Yes, yeah, so inside of a print statement, if I just say print z, uh, let's go ahead and print the type of Z first and let's see what happens. Okay, so Z is an int and then it printed the int. Okay, the reason why we had that error earlier where we said um, this is an int. All right, watch what happens now. Okay, we get an error. The reason why we get this error is because we're mixing the two. Okay, when, when I try to print a string with a number, it, it's gonna be like, hey, I, I have this string, I wanna print it, but I can't uh, do it with a number here. I don't know what to do. Anytime I put this plus sign next to a string, so a value inside of quotation marks, anytime it's there, it's not gonna do math. Okay, if this was X plus Y, okay, that is working as addition. Okay, this right here though, we're not adding two numbers together, we're trying to connect two strings together. We're trying to do string concatenation, which would work great if I said, you know, this is another string. All right, I could print this up and it would work just fine. And you would never even know that it was two different strings that were printed. I could do this with two different variables. 
um, if I had like variable A equals um, first name and then variable B equals last name. All right, I could come into here and say A, which is a string plus B. And it'll basically do the exact same thing that we just saw with the last one. And it'll just concatenate those two strings. All right, so whenever we see the plus sign in Python, uh, it has a couple of different meanings that it could take on depending on its context. One is addition, some type of mathematical arithmetic, and the other is string concatenation, where you're combining two strings. Now, if I try to say last name plus 50, okay, now we're mixing data types because A is a string, 50 is an integer, and then that's when we'll see this error can only concatenate string, not int, because Python doesn't know how to concatenate anything but strings. So if I wanted to, to, to print a number with a string, then I would have to convert that number to a string. And then we could go ahead and do that. Great question. Okay, any other questions, you guys? Sweet, let's keep going with the Kahoot. All right, wise, who is wise guy? Nice, Brandon. All right, here we go. What is the output of the following code? Okay, awesome, you guys. Let's go ahead and look at it. We had a couple people fooled, uh, almost a quarter, okay, or over a quarter. So uh, why was it 12? So we had 12 or 13. Why was it 12 and not 13? What do you guys think? Because the program ran the math before it changed the tax value. Yeah, so line six totally changed tax, all right? Tax at the end of this is equal to three. So if we had run what's on line four, if we like copied and pasted this line and put it on line seven and said total equals price plus, price plus tax again, it would have been 13 because it would have been 10 plus three. But total was assigned when tax was still two. So on line four, total gets the value of 12. And then I could change any other variable in the universe and it's not gonna change total, okay? And so on line eight, by the time I print total, total hasn't changed again. It was assigned on line four to 12 and it's still 12. All right, questions on this one? Sweet. Nathan J, nice work. Okay, what is the output of the following code? So while you guys are thinking about this, since we have potentially 45 more seconds. Um, does anybody know what modulus two is used for a lot? Elijah? Uh, checking odd and even numbers. Yeah, it is an extremely easy way to check to see if a number is odd or even. Because think about it, if I have like five modulus two, two goes into four evenly twice and there's one left over. So if that is equal to one, then I know it's an odd number. If whatever modulus two is equal to zero, then I know it's an even number. Because if I said six modulus two, two goes into six evenly three times with zero left over. And so even numbers will always output a zero and odd numbers will always output a one. Sorry, I just like spoiled the answer there. Okay, so let's look at this. Um, so we had a couple people think that it was 11 point or 11%. One person thought that. Uh, quite a few thought it was 5.5 and two people thought it was zero, okay? Uh, what would make this 5.5? If it was division. If it was division, just a single forward slash, that would be 5.5. We can look at this, okay? And I'm just gonna say print uh, 11 divided by two. Okay, there's our 5.5. 
All right, but modulus, remember what modulus does. Okay, it'll say, okay, how many times does two go into 11? Well, it doesn't matter. It goes into it five times completely. Okay, five or 10 divided by two is five. Um, but what modulus isolates is that extra number. Okay, whatever, what, whatever the remainder is. And so when we print this one, 11 modulus two, it'll be like, oh, yep, one's, one is left over after that. Okay. All right. Next one. What is the output of this code if the user types one zero? Okay. Wow, that's the first one that the minority got it right. So uh, who wants to explain why it would cause an error? Let me pull this back up again. Why would it cause an error? Uh, Ian, go ahead. Uh, because an input is always uh, a string. And so then it's trying to do the cost as a string times a number, which isn't gonna produce anything that can't do that. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Gavin coded, you guys want to add anything? Okay, yeah, you nailed it right on the head. So data types are really important uh, in pretty much every language. Um, but just like with that error that we got when we we're trying to concatenate a string with an int, it's like, I can't do that. I can only concatenate a string with a string. Well, math is the same way. You can only do math with numbers, whether they're ints or floats, it doesn't matter but you can't throw strings in there. It will, it will throw an error. Let me show you what that error looks like. Uh, I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna say X equals, uh, we'll say input, uh, enter a number. And then uh, we're gonna say cost equals X times two. And then we'll print cost. Okay, and watch what happens. So enter a number, I'm gonna say five. Oh, wow. That's really interesting that I did that. And look what it did. X is, I, I typed in five and it like multiplied the number five by itself. So it didn't like actually do math. It just like added a five next to a five. Coded, did you, did you want to say something? Do you think that kind of how um, strings have a relationship with a plus sign, do you think it has a relationship with the times as well? Whereas if you times a string with a number, it instead prints the string multiple times? Yeah, and that's exactly what it did. That's exactly what it did. So if I put like a, a plus right here, we would want this to say seven. But if I run this and I say five, it's going to say, <laughs> interesting. So there are many programming languages that if you try to do that, it would just output five two. It would, it would concatenate those and it would output five two. Uh, but what we can see from both of these is that you do not want to do math with strings involved because it will never give you what you want ever, okay? Uh, in this case, it did throw an error. That last time though, it, it didn't throw an error. I wonder if that has to do with a Python version. Um, but yeah, that one, that one did not throw an error. That's really interesting. And it's interesting that that didn't throw an error, but X plus two did throw an error. Okay, let's go to the next one. All right, this might be our last one. What's the output if the user types 2.5?
this is like a good exercise for a test question. So I didn't run this and I wasn't trying to do the math in my head, um, but I'm pretty sure it's the red one. And let me just walk you through how I canceled out the rest of them. Um, oh, it's the green one. All right, let's see why it caused an error. Anyone know why it caused the error? It's asking for an int, but the user is putting it afloat. Interesting. Ooh, good catch. Good catch. So the user typed in 2.5. Um, well, let's try let's try running that real quick. So I'm gonna display that. I'm just gonna write this up real quick over here. I'm gonna say import math. Okay, we got one minute. Uh, radius equals int input radius. Let's see what Eric gives us. Eric equals math dot pi times radius to the second power print f area is area two. that it? That was it, except for the period right there. Okay, let's run this and see what we get. Oh, whoops, 2.5. Yeah, clean and nailed it. Okay, invalid literal for int with base 10, 2.5. Okay, and that gave us our error. Okay, awesome. All right, you guys, um, I hope that this was helpful to, helpful today. Uh, I, I love doing this with you guys. I've had fun. Um, but if you guys think of any more questions or need help with anything else, just post on Slack. So, okay. Have a good one, guys. It's good to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. You too. Thank you.